Okay, hi, Hilary and Juliet. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And we get to talk to two experts who've been researching about rubber for a while, rubber in Laos, and also in the region, in the lower Mekong region for a while. So my first question to you, Juliet. So you've been re researching about rubber quite a bit in, the, in Laos and also the investments that have come in from China. Can you tell us a little bit about what has been the history of rubber and its investments into Laos. Rubber is one of multiple boom crops that have kind of swept across all of mainland Southeast Asia, you could say. We could, the, the whole Mekong region has seen a lot of crop booms, especially since the early 2000s. It really started expanding in the 2000s, but the conditions enabling the rubber boom, I think, were laid in the prior decade. So in the 90s, you saw tons of new land laws um, around the region. A couple other foreign donors really were pouring money into the land titling. Um, the national forest allocation policy, a couple of different policies, basically delineated village boundaries from forest areas and put forest under the, the authority of the Laos state. And so in the 2000s, when uh, developing countries, including Laos, started seeking foreign investment um, into land as a way of kind of jump-starting their agricultural sector development. Uh, that whole land titling um, decade really made it very fast for foreign investors to come in, get uh, land concessions, and be able to invest in crops. And so rubber was the top crop um, invested in for a good chunk of that time of, of rapid agricultural expansion in Laos. Um, this was kind of paired with factors like the global price of rubber. It skyrocketed through the 2000s. It was basically a bubble in the rubber price globally. And it was also that Laos's neighbors, China and Vietnam, had big rubber estates, big rubber state companies um, that had run out of and exhausted their access to cheap land and were looking to expand. It was really lucrative because of the high prices, um, and it grows in uplands where high levels of poverty in Laos are particularly concentrated. And so rubber started to be seen, especially in northern Laos, as kind of a silver bullet for development in the uplands of the country. Um, and one more piece of that was, you know, opium eradication campaigns had been run a, lo a lot in northern Laos. Um, so yeah, most rubber in Laos was, um, rapidly kind of established between 2006 and 2011. Um, but the earliest, uh, people that established rubber in Laos were smallholders right on the Chinese. Yeah. There's these multiple explanations as to how rubber boomed in Laos between 2006 and the early 2010s. Keyword for us, us being the UN Red program specifically, we have this project going on right now for the UN Red uh, program uh, in the Lower Mekong. The UN Red being uh, an initiative to reduce deforestation and uh, forest degradation. So, keyword there for us is deforestation. Can you tell us a little bit about rubber and its impact on? natural forests. Yeah, it's been fascinating to kind of think through deforestation through a specific crop. Um, think of it as a line of dominoes to think even past, you know, the, the larger res, um, faith that we put in monoculture, the push that we have for commercial export oriented cash crops. These kind of things have all led to this rubber boom and the fact that rubber is deforesting. So definitely rubber has been a huge driver of deforestation. So we have to also think about how rubber intersects with forest cover, right? So um, a lot of the remaining forest cover was in the uplands, these places that were harder to tap into for timber extraction, et cetera. So you had good forests in the uplands and rubber is one of the few crops, um, one of the few big cash crops, high earning crops that grow well um, on on a sloping land at higher elevations. Um, and so rubber was not only extremely um, lucrative uh, in terms of calculations based on prices in the 2000s, and um, there are always all these other pressures. It also happened to be a crop that fits in the places where remaining forests were because oil palm, another crop that we really think of as driving deforestation, oil palm has moved into those traditional rubber producing areas and pushed rubber north. So definitely rubber has been people attributed it as one of the top drivers of deforestation in the mainland Mekong, uh, the mainland Southeast Asian region, but um, a lot of it is thinking, I think of it in terms of this like long domino effect line of factors. Uh, that's really interesting. Other deforestation crops also even more adding to the pressure of deforestation by rubber in Laos and in the region. 
I'm going to turn mm -hmm. over to Hillary. So what, how do you see the current landscape of rubber? I think one of the interesting things about rubber was that, you know, not only was it a crop that uh, was promoted for foreign investment in Laos, and so you saw it coming in as, um, you know, a crop favoured by uh, international companies through concessions on land um, granted to them by the state, but it was also attractive to and promoted to rural households as a form of sedentary agriculture. So you saw a large take up of production um, in households and there's actually kind of a perverse sort of policy circle there uh, to a certain extent with the government promoting sedentary agriculture instead of shifting cultivation. Um, and rubber was one of the early crops that they promoted. So smallholders, um, smallholders took it up um, partly through um, partly through the forest land allocation process, but also in Northern Land, particularly the opium replacement uh, policy. Um, the reason that the government promoted that was because they saw those households as driving deforestation through their shifting cultivation. There's currently around 280,000 hectares um, of rubber planted in Laos and about 150,000, two, sorry, 250,000 of those hectares went in between 2006 and 2014. So the bulk of it went in there. There was a bit that came in before and a bit that's come in afterwards, but really the core um, of that went in in that kind of 10 year period. Um, and that's sustaining latex production now. So um, around, I think it's around 90% of the crop now is actually producing latex. So it's really in its prime from that point of view. Um, at the moment, about 53% of the area in rubber, of rubber in Laos is uh, uh, either smallholder owned um, and managed or is under contract farming. So it's a partnership between farmers and companies um, and the rest of it is under concessions on state lands. And farmers often sometimes intercrop um, with their rubber at the very early stages so that they can get another crop until the rubber uh, grows up enough to produce latex um, that can be tapped at a sustainable or a constant supply. Um, and when they when they start tapping, um, you know, two to three tonnes per hectare per year is a, is a reasonable yield, um, but it produces a really good income for, for households that, um, tap it as well as the companies uh, companies that tap it and farmers who tap rubber you know really see a good income from rubber. Um, the ownership of rubber is much more diverse uh, and mixed in the north you see concessions you see small holders and you see contract farmers all all together uh, in the south it seems to be much more dominated by concessions um, and there's also a split there in the sense that you see the Chinese investors operating in the north and the Vietnamese investors um, operating in the south, and that's obviously to do with proximity to the markets. Um, and then um, uh, in the middle, there's a bit of Thai investment as well. Um, so, for example, in the Wang Prabang, where you guys will be having a look, there's a really strong mix there of small concessions, contract farming, and smallholder uh, grown. Um, uh, smallholder grown rubber. So it's a really nice mix of investment types uh, in that area for you to look at. Thanks, Hilary. So yeah, a, lo a little bit of geopolitics also coming in as I heard you talking about more smallholders, more diverse mix of things happening in the North with the Chinese investments, whereas in the South, a lot more concessions. So bigger areas being allocated to companies um, and especially investors from, from Vietnam. And you also mentioned, Hillary, uh, about the 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 age uh, of these rubber trees, when they were planted, their their subsequent age, uh, and how they contribute to whether it's latex, whether they're under tapping, and at what stages they're under tapping. So I think it's important for us to understand a bit about the supply chain. What is the rubber supply chain? Um, Juliet, can you tell us a little bit about what is the rubber supply chain in general? How does that work? So a little bit of rubber is going into a ton of different products that we use every day and then a ton of products that are really important. Um, but yeah, 71% of natural rubber today is consumed by the global tire um, industry. 
Um, China is the top consumer and Thailand and Indonesia and Malaysia are the top producers. So China consumes um, uh, far more than India, US, Thailand are, are kind of far behind China. And then over 90% of, of natural rubber globally is produced by those three countries, Indonesia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. So when we think about what what is between the tree and the tire um you have rubber trees which are um 99% of the trees that um the world taps for rubber latex um are Havea brasiliensis but so you take a rubber tree you kind of insert a small um tapped line in it and then latex which is this kind of milky liquid which you guys will see on your trip the latex is collected in cups and then kind of coagulated. There's um, chemicals that coagulate or you can let them kind of sit out and and co coagulate on their own. Um, and then the cups of, of latex are kind of combined, brought to a factory, washed, shredded, um, and they're basically kind of, they're heated up to kind of stick together and then hung, um, hung out to dry. So in, in the case of Laos, most rubber is being sent to either to China through the border with Yunnan in the north of Laos, or it's being sent into Vietnam um, to be kind of processed. And then Vietnam sells most of its rubber. It, it does um, kind of produce some, but um, but it's going through usually those two countries. Some is going out to Thailand. It takes about five to seven years for tapping to start. And most rubber trees, you know, can be tapped for around 25 years. Um, and then the latex starts to decline. So once the trees mature, they've been tapped for a long time, um, the supply drops are off and it doesn't become so economical to maintain uh, the um, maintain the tree for the latex production. Um, and depending on how the crop's been managed um, and the management does affect the wood, uh, people can then harvest the trees. And rubber wood is an extremely important and, in, and a uh, increasingly important wood crop in Southeast Asia. Um, so previously, Malaysia was the biggest supplier of rubber logs. And I think now Thailand has just taken over Malaysia as the global uh, biggest global producer of rubber logs, uh, most of which, again, is going into China, but also into other countries. And it's used for solid wood products. So a lot of furniture is now made out of rubber wood because it's light, it's easy to use. Um, uh, but the problem with it is that, that it needs to be treated um, before it's uh, manufactured into products. So rubber wood deteriorates very quickly because of the high latex content in the wood. And there's only primary processing in Laos. So yeah. um, the kind of value addition to the crop is relatively limited in that sense in that it gets, you know, smoked and then directly exported and then the other countries actually turned it into the products that most people um, use. While there's big rubber wood uh, sectors in China and Vietnam and Thailand, um, it wasn't until 2021 that the first rubber wood processing facility opened up in Laos, and that's in Luang Nam Tha, which has some of the oldest rubber trees. Um, and that uh, small wood processing factory, it's really only very small at the moment, is uh, peeling rubber logs and shipping the veneer from that peeling process back into China, where it's been manufactured into plywood. And then it's being re-imported back into Laos. So um, until that um, factory uh, ramps up in scale, there's, there's going to be an export re-import. But it's certainly a really good opportunity for rubber growers in the future in Laos to sell their wood. So what I'm hearing, Hilary, is that we talked about the history of rubber in Laos and it seemed like it was a really long time uh, crop that's been here. But actually the processing, especially on the rubber log side, rubber wood side, is actually just coming in. You said 2021 was the first uh, processing plant in Long Nam Tha. Yep. So it takes a while first for that latex industry to come in. Most of it is exported or all of it is eventually exported. And then now is finally when we're seeing possibly uh, a start of an eventual wood industry. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And, and the challenge is going to be um, how sustainable is that wood industry and how will the rubber crop compete with other crops that particularly farmers uh, might choose to plant as an alternative to rubber in the future? Right. Okay. 
So there is, you mentioned sustainability, there's sustainability in terms of how does it sustain a livelihood? How does it sustain in terms of an in industry, the volume that you need? We also have sustainability, another keyword that we're focused on in our program, UNRED program, in terms of how sustainable is that production line, the whole supply chain. So the question to you, Juliet, sustainability in the rubber industry itself, how, how is the wor world responding to sustainability as a demand from the consumers? There's been a big response and a serious response, partly because of these numbers um, in terms of deforestation. And as Hillary was mentioning, there are a number of spots along the supply chain that um, considerable concerns about pollution, environmental impacts of other sorts are key. Um, but the most high profile point of pressure that's been used so far is really the deforestation question. And um, what you saw was a lot of intense public pressure. Um, and that's come, come along with uh, an influx of funding into deforestation related efforts since the 2000s. So in the early 2010s, there were a few reports that came out really um, pushing against land dispossession since the 2000, the, the mid 2000s when um, a couple different actors in the private sector have taken up um, and responded to pressure that's been put on them about the environmental impacts. And at this point, Almost all of the top, and at this point, all of the top global tire companies have declared some kind of environmental sustainability initiative around their rubber supply chains. Um, the waterfall of action kind of came, I think it started with Michelin, um, which is one of the top tire companies. Um, they've combined and they have created the um, global platform for sustainable natural rubber. Um, but in parallel, the um, DFID, which is the U UK aid branch, along with a couple um, civil society organizations, including Mighty Earth, um, and they've been working with a Chinese um, industry representative called the Chamber of Commerce for Metal, Mineral and Chemical Importers. So these are the people in China who are buying latex from the producers in China and beyond. Um, so it's also a bit of a downstream um, initiative, but they have formed uh, the Sustainable Natural Rubber Guidelines, which are in English and in Chinese, and they've targeted kind of rolling this out um, getting Chinese companies that do investment in or grow their own rubber plantations. And there's also a Vietnamese initiative um, by the Vietnam Rubber Group, which is Vietnam's main state-owned enterprise in the rubber sector. And they've rolled out um, voluntary guidelines mitigating socio-environmental risks for Vietnamese outward investors in agriculture in the Mekong subregion. So it's a pretty Mekong re region, Vietnamese investor specific um, uh, initiative. And these are, are really exciting, right? So we have a number of different uh, potentially impactful initiatives coming out of a bunch of different actors. Um, and I think what's especially exciting about these initiatives is that you see action from uh, private sector actors, not only from OECD countries, but from Chinese and Vietnamese companies. All of these initiatives are very, very new. So, you know, the, the GPSNR, the Global Platform for, for Sustainable Natural Rubber, um, that was kind of brought together by tire companies, but they've had a huge a number of other actors kind of join in including smallholder representatives, they're just past the phase of kind of defining what sustainability is and how they want to go about it. Um, there are a few steps past that, but um, same with the Chinese and Vietnamese in, um, initiatives. They are in the stage of trying to disseminate their guidelines, but their guidelines are voluntary. Um, their guidelines are both um you know, they're not linked to specific mechanisms of implementation. It's to be taken up by um by kind of companies that are interested um, voluntarily. So there's a lot of questions. And I think another thing to look at when you assess these initiatives is whether it's downstream actors or upstream, because they're all trying to get the producers upstream to change their behavior, but they're all kind of sitting lower downstream. So a lot of questions about how these are going to kind of actually make impact on the ground, but a big change, I would say, in the last five years in this sense. Got it. So we can't hold our breath, but at the same time, this is an yeah. exciting new direction that we're seeing emerging. A key point for us is how do we get, as you said, the 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 upstream involved, and particularly the smallholders. Uh, plenty of them in the northern landscape, as Hillary pointed out. 
how do we get them not as just involved in a lucrative industry, but one that can be sustainable for them as well. And here I want to bring up government. So what's been the role of government? How do they see uh, the rubber industry as a potential for for Lao, for economic development, for economic and social and sustainable development? Over to Hillary. Yes, quite early on, as I mentioned, um, there was the government was really interested in rubber as a crop for all sorts of social, social and economic benefits, you know, whether it was opium replacement or, um, you know, new livelihood opportunities for households. So they were quite proactive in promoting rubber as a crop. And, you know, there were study tours to China early on and um, invited tours from Vietnamese rubber growers quite early on um, in the process. So I guess from a geopolitical sense, there was collaboration there um, very early on. Um, and with that promotion um, and the rapid acceleration of uh, investment in rubber, as Julia mentioned, there were some issues. Um, the government's response to these issues was to introduce moratoria on uh, the granting of concession land for, for rubber. So they, they did that a couple of times in 2009 and again in 2012. So um, you see in the uptake of rubber, you know, these kind of steps or halts um, where the government put a break on uh, promoting rubber to try and buy themselves some time to address some of the social and environmental issues that were coming up. And some of those were around land and our companies were accessing land. But there were also concerns about labour um, and other related issues as well. Um, so the last moratorium came in in um, 2012 and... Um, since then, the government has been working to uh, look at the quality of investment in a whole lot of activities, and rubber uh, is one of those. Um, there's still a moratorium on granting land concessions for rubber um, because there are still concerns about particularly the land allocation um, to uh, rubber and the loss of land use rights for some people associated with that land granting process. But the government is certainly still promoting rubber or enabling rubber to households and also to contract farming. And there's uh, activities underway to try and strengthen regulations, particularly around contract farming. Um, alongside the sustainability initiatives that Juliet mentioned, the government of Laos has made some very strong commitments to things like timber legality. So through the voluntary partnership agreement with the European Union, um, they're working towards ensuring that all export wood products are uh, verified as legal and rubber certainly falls in that. Um, and with that, um, there have been some conundrums, as there are with other smallholder grown crops, in that um, there are certain regulations that a lot of smallholders don't meet um, and some of those are around the legality of the land their trees are planted on and a requirement to register their plantations with government. For, for Julia, you and Hillary, both of you. So what are the key opportunities for Lao in terms of rubber as a sustainable industry, as well as the bottlenecks? What were the challenges? The challenges, there, there, there is a different, there's, there's different sets of challenges. Um, for the, for the smallholder, um, and I'll talk about the wood because that's the bit that I have focused on mostly, there are going to be challenges for smallholders to produce legal rubber wood. So there's still a whole raft of regulations that they need to comply with um, and they're not complying with them now, partly because they're new to rubber growers. They weren't aware that they needed to register their plantations and there's a huge legacy of rubber plantations that uh, need to be registered um, for the wood to be legal. So, you know, 280,000 hectares in total, maybe 140 odd thousand of smallholder or contract farmers, all of those need to be registered if that, that wood is going to be legally exportable and or comply with uh, the voluntary standards like FSC. Um, the, the bottleneck is going to be that the companies who want to buy rubber wood in Laos to process, um, they also impose. Um, or, or they also seek to comply with standards like the FSC. Um, so they're very keen for the smallholder produced wood to be compliant with that. So um, I think there's going to be a lag there um, to meet that um, to meet that that requirement. And the other for the wood is around raising awareness amongst farmers of the opportunity from their wood because our research showed that 
uh, farmers really have a very low awareness of the value of their trees for wood at the moment. They're cutting it down and using it for firewood. Um, and so they need, firstly, they need to be aware of the value of the wood. And secondly, they need to be aware that the wood has to be primary processed or treated very, very quickly. And that means having uh, that infrastructure quite close to uh, the resource areas. So there needs to be some uh, broad scale mapping and classification, at least by age, of rubber in Laos so that the industry can uh, look to situate themselves where uh, rubber is going to become rubber wood um, in a staged, you know, in a staged process. So get the industry where the old trees are now. Yeah, so having both Chinese and Vietnamese investment in Laos makes it a great place for both countries' guidelines to um, to be implemented and for, you know, for people who study and try to um, support that kind of initiative. It will also take a long time before these initiatives are kind of running. And I think a little bit of the danger of focusing on a specific crop um, as someone who only uh, only studies rubber, but is, is, you know, studies crop booms also um, more, more broadly is, you know, if we focus on just the first domino, just the crop itself, we're going to miss the whole line. And those are just going to keep knocking down other, other crops that are going to deforest. So, you know, we've tried um, protecting certain spots and we've, and we're trying now protecting forests from certain crops. There has to be a way to connect those dots um, and to both intervene in, in supply chains that are driving rapid change um, and to think about the like landscape scale solutions. And I also, I mean, as yeah, it as someone who's looking at these trends um, globally in terms of the rise in rubber, the, the bubble that we saw in the price that drove such rapid um, expansion, that bubble and that combined with kind of this zeal in the 2000s for large scale land investments, concession granting, that's just gone away. And where the growth we're going to see is smallholder driven and, you know, figuring out how to get smallholders not to invest in lucrative crops. It's ethically a very, it's a hot potato, you know, it's a, it's a complex um, thing to intervene in. It's uh, less clear good versus evil than, um, then, you know, and it's also much harder to wrangle hundreds of smallholders than kind of going up against or trying to change the behavior of one big, bad, um, you know, impactful investor so that the ethics of this are going to be much more complex and less cut and dry than just, you know, getting one big, bad plantation company to behave. Um, so like everything it'll get more and more complex as we go absolutely agree um okay thanks both of you lots of reason to to be optimistic and look forward but also plenty of challenges ahead and we can't assume that things are going to change overnight one last question for the both of you okay so during the course of this workshop that we're having, uh, we are going to visit a rubber supply chain. You have both been to this area, uh, the company Zhonghe, and also two villages that we're going to visit. Can you tell us what would you say are some of the highlights, something that you know we, you think the participants should uh, keep in mind uh, to watch out for? Any, any, anything you, you want to recommend? Uh, the one thing I was going to encourage is to take a picture of the sign going into the factory. I believe, if I recall, um, that they will advertise in many different ways. And if you if you talk to Mr. Yang, um, ask him about how his company does well. Like he's very proud of um, his company participates in a Chinese program called the Opium Replacement Program. And for China, that's been a really, really important um, development initiative, right? So China, the Chinese state so, like was subsidizing and now provides other forms of support to rubber investors and a bunch of other agribusiness investors as um, a form of opium replacement. And that was modeled on the UN interventions in Myanmar in the 90s, um, alternative development to reduce opium. Um, there's, I've, you know, I've, I've studied this program a lot. They do it obviously differently in Chinese characteristics compared to the UN and UNODC approach. Um, but I believe it's on the sign going into his his factory, and they really take this. His they his company considers this rubber plantation and the factory not just um, a business enterprise, but really a development cooperation enterprise. So ask him about that. Um, yeah, I think things to um, think about and look out for. One of the things 
um, about, you know, working in rubber is that it's often a family um, activity. So, you know, men, women and children uh, together in the field and there are, there are positives and, and negatives um, to that. But um, I guess talk, talk to people about um, the, the pluses and minuses of rubber in their lives and the decisions that they've made to participate in rubber. If you do get to talk to some, you know, who have opted to do it on their own and others who participate in selling uh, to Mr Yang um, because there are, there are differences between them. Um, who they sell to, um, yeah. you know, I think the, the sign going into the factory also has the price um, of rubber up. So, you know, it's the, the price is up there, but people choose different ways um, to sell their rubber. And, um, you know, sometimes it's directly to the company and other, way, other times it's through middlemen. So understanding uh, those different pathways to trade rubber um, are interesting. Um, also, I mean, it's an interesting crop to look at in itself. It's a very managed tree crop. Um, often plantations are, but for rubber, um, there's specifics about, you know, tip pruning the trees when they're young so you can maximise the canopy cover because the broader canopy um, increases latex yield. So, you know, it's quite an actively managed crop from that point of view. But, of course, that also has con consequences for wood supply. Um, and that's a very under-researched area and people aren't really thinking about that. So, you know, it, it's a different looking tree crop um, from other, other crops. Also how people tap and manage the, um, the incision on their tree for, um, for the latex, you know, that has consequences um, for the, the wood quality. I think the other thing to think about is when people are working in rubber um, plantations, you know, they're out in the early morning um, doing, doing work tapping. Um, and I don't think that we've actually mentioned the hours that people work when they do tapping. Um, so families will be out at, you know, 1, 3 a.m. actually um, working in their rubber plantations. So it's a very different labour uh, arrangement for them. Um, and in that, they're exposed to various health risks as well. So I guess there's, there's um, some questions maybe for the farmers that you meet about the lifestyle choice that they've made to participate um, in, in rubber as a, as a crop. Um, I guess the only other thing to look out for is um, the overwhelming aroma of arriving at the factory, but I'm sure that's something everyone will enjoy when they get there. <laughs> the smell of Chinese money, as they call it, <laughs> some people say. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, both of you. It makes me realise that, to say the obvious, that you know, visiting these places for a day is not even the tip of any iceberg out there on rubber.